All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Marshall Clough, and this is uh, my talk, Stood Midpoint, How Hard Can It Be? If this is not the talk you're expecting, you might be in the wrong room, or I might be in the wrong room, but I'm going to give this talk here anyway. Um, a bit about me, because, you know, everything's always about me. Um, uh, I have been working on... Um, LLVM for about eight years, and I've been working on libc++, the standard library implementation of LLVM for about seven, and currently I'm, I am the co-donor, which means I'm the person responsible for libc++. Um, I work for a company called the C++ Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization. Uh, their mission is to encourage the development of excellent open source C++ libraries. Um, you may have seen this logo floating around the conference. They, uh, we are a sponsor of the conference here. Um, I'm also the chairman of the library working group on the standards committee, the C++ standards committee. Um, I have various contacting, contact information here if you need to get a hold of me. And um, that's enough about me. Okay, in, um, before we get to standard midpoint, I want to have a, can I skip? No, okay. Um, I wanted to have, a bit of a, uh, give you a bit of information, uh, kind of a meta discussion about how do things get into the standard library? Well, the easy answer is people propose them and we decide whether or not to put them in. But the, the more interesting question is how do we choose? How do we choose what is, I don't want to say worthy because that's not the right word. What is appropriate for it putting in the standard library? And we kind of have the three big buckets. Okay, is this generally useful? Is this something that almost everybody is going to use? And string and vector and things like that are, you know, poster childs for that. Um, is this something that is really hard to get right, to get exactly right? Are there lots of corner cases that, a, you know, that shall we say naive implementations would miss? Um, shared pointer absolutely falls into this category. There are all sorts of very, very weird corner cases in shared pointer that most people never see because your implementation takes care of them for you. Um, and then there is is something you, we want to provide a, um, a portable standard interface to something that's inherently unportable. Um, in C++ 17, we had std file system, which lets you enumerate the elements and manipulate elements in your file system. And it doesn't really matter whether you're on Windows or on Linux or on Mac OS, whether your underlying file system is APFS or EXT3 or ZFS or whatever. Uh, the point is, is that that same calls work on all of these. And so this lets people who are not standard library implementers not worry about all those things and worry about solving the problems they want to solve. So this is kind of how things, when, how we evaluate proposals to add things to the standard library. And these are very big buckets. This is, this is very much a judgment call. Is, is something like, you know, there are a whole bunch of things that didn't get into C++ 17, that, or excuse me, C++ 20. We would have kind of liked to get in there, but we ran out of time and we'll be considering them later. Uh, we had a really nice proposal for um, a stack trace library that allows you to capture stack traces and, and, and then walk them, not actually manipulate the, 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 the contents of the stack, but for error reporting and so on. It'll be back. Um, if you have been to Vittorio's talk about function references, I think that was this morning, wasn't it? He has a function ref object that he is proposing for the standard library. These things. Um, so we have a lot of there are a lot of new things in C20. There were there were a ton of things in C17. There will be more in what we're calling C2B or 20, what will probably be 23. Anyway, so one of the things that was added for C20 um, was a, a very simple call called std midpoint. Okay? And um, it's supposed, you're supposed to give it two numbers and it will return to you the middle, basically. Not the not really the average, but the midpoint between them. Um, Davis Herring, who's from Sandia Labs, wrote, wrote the proposal. And he wrote in this, 
in this thing, the simple problem of computing a value between two other values is surprisingly subtle in general. And he was not being ironic. He said, he pointed out that here is a sample implementation of a plus b, return a plus b over two. Okay, and you look at that and you think to yourself, why would anybody write this? What, do, what, why do you give it a name? A plus b over two is probably shorter than midpoint. Um, why would you do this? Why not just write a over two? Why, why is this worth putting in the standard library? And the answer is, is because, well, let's let's not before I jump ahead of myself. Does anybody see any problems with this code? I'm, overflow, right. I want to point out just by the way that, um, yes, overflow. A billion, a billion and a half, what is it? you expect the midpoint of a billion and a billion and a half to be a billion and a quarter. But a plus b over two gives you undefined behavior. It gives you some negative number if you're lucky. It gives you, you know, your, your computer crashes if you're not. Um, undefined behavior, by the way, I have a whole other talk on undefined behavior, but the gist of it is, is, is undefined behavior is behavior that the standard places no requirements on. It's not required to give you the right answer, it's not required to give you the wrong answer, it's not required to give you any answer at all. It can, it can abort, it can erase your file system, it can set fire to your neighbor's house. Or as I say in my talk, is like, it can get my cat pregnant. And I don't have a cat. <laughs> anyway, I, at a previous, Previous year at this conference, I gave an hour-long talk about undefined behavior. You can find it on YouTube if you want. I don't need to give that talk again. But anyway, right. Uh, I was talking to, um, sorry, back up a second. This bug, this overflow bug, existed in Java's binary search for more than a decade. Um, this existed in Mozilla's um, JavaScript implementation for many years. Um, this is an easy thing to write, a plus b over 2. But it's wrong. I was talking to somebody earlier this week who shall remain nameless because I don't wish to embarrass him. And he said, you just do, you, instead of doing addition, you do subtraction. And just do it like this. And he said, and then it'll work for this. And absolutely it will. But it also overflows for other sets of inputs. Consider if A is 1 billion and B, or A, B is 1.5 billion like before, but A is negative 1 billion. And then the subtraction wants to form 2.5 billion. And you overflow again. So we can't do this. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about today has to do with the fact that with when um, when dealing with numeric values in C++, they're not numbers. They're not math. They're representations of numbers. They are approximations of what we think of as numbers. And until you deeply, deeply believe that, you're going to be led astray by things like A plus B over 2. Okay? They're not numbers, they're not, they're numeric types. What's the differences? They have limits, they can overflow, they can underflow. Um, and they're discrete. If you take the midpoint of zero and one in an integer, there are no numbers between zero and one. It can't give you the, the thing halfway between zero and one because there aren't any. Um, floating point numbers have the exact same problem, it's just that they're they're finer grain. There's a call in the C library called next after, for example, which will give you, if you have a floating point number, will give you the next representable number in that floating, in that floating point representation. And there are no numbers in between them. Just like there are no numbers between zero and one when you're dealing with integer types. And this is really, this is the crux of almost all the things I'm going to show you today is that we don't have math, we have numeric types.
Anyway, um, also we have a few interesting behaviors we inherited from C. Sometimes those are really handy. Sometimes they reach out and bite us, and you will see a couple of those. Okay, so we're going to. This is the um, specification. This is most of the specification, I should say. Um, const x for t midpoint takes two t's by value. It's no except. Um, constraints. T is an arithmetic type that's not bool. We don't want to do midpoint false true or true false. Um, returns half the sum of a and b. It says, basically, if it says it's you can't represent that, if it's an integer type and the sum is odd, then the result is rounded towards a. So what does that mean? It means that the midpoint of 1 and 4, right, if you had math, it would be 2 and a half. But you've got to pick two and three between two and three. So the midpoint of one and four is two. But if you turn the inputs around, the midpoint between four and one is three. And then there's some constraints. No overflow occurs, yay, no undefined behavior. You can call this with any any inputs. And on floating point stuff, on floating point operations, we say we do most one inexact operation. Because when you do arithmetic on floating point on floating points, sometimes you lose information. You know, if you divide, say, by two, a floating point number by two, you may lose that last bit of your representation. Anyway, I talked about the examples. Um, anyway, so from now on, I'm going to be leaving off templates. I'm going to be leaving off no except. I'm kind of inconsistent about leaving off const expert. That's not, the leaving them off is deliberate because this is slideware. You can just take them as read. Um, I don't want to, um, I don't want to take up, you know, a bunch of space on my slides to obscure the things I'm going to make. Uh, okay. Also, if you have questions along the way, just please just put up your hands and ask them. Don't, I, I may say to you at some point, I may say, I have a slide coming up for that, but otherwise I'll just try to answer it right off the tick. Okay. All right, so we have three different kinds of, of actually, I skipped something here. Um, this talks about T as arithmetic types uh, other than bool. There is a third specialization for pointers. So we're gonna, we have integral types, we have pointers, we have floating point types. Those, those are the three things that you can pass to midpoint. Okay, integral types. And now we're gonna digress for a second. I'm gonna talk about what is an integral type because there's has been some confusion about this. Um, if you go read the standard, which I don't recommend, but, but you know, if you're if you're really curious, you can. There are basically there are five integral types that the standard defines, and they're listed there. There are also implementation defined extended integer types. Okay, and those are ones that you get from your implementation. And those, and then there's also bool, care, w care, t, so on and so on, are um, integral types as well. The key here is that you as users and me as a standard library, I don't get to, nope, sorry. Um, I don't get, I don't, we don't get to define new integral types, okay? You can't make a big num class and have it be an integral type. It's not. There, these are ones that come out of the compiler, okay? There's a bunch of other integral types that aren't up here. Um, they are synonyms or aliases for other integral types, things like size t and pointer diff t and uint pointer t and things like that. Okay? Um, but those are synonyms. They're the same. Um, every sign, sign type has a corresponding unsigned type, which is the same type. Same, excuse me, let me try that again. Not the same type, the same size. Okay, but the key is you don't get to define your own. Okay, so the general idea for doing midpoint in a safe way, integral midpoint, is that we want to do this work as unsigned. We want to do all our arithmetic in the unsigned realm because over signed, uns signed integer overflow is undefined behavior. Unsigned integer overflow is defined behavior. So if you take a, an unsigned zero 
and subtract one from it, you get a very big number. You get all Fs in your representation. I mean, that's a defined behavior. Um, signed integer arithmetic is defined to be modulo 2 to the n, where n is the width of the integer in bits. So it wraps around. And you can convert signed integers to unsigned integers um, without any loss of precision. And this is a great thing. Every assigned integer type has a corresponding unsigned integer type. That was the last thing. But this bit here, this is, this is its name. <laughs> There's a type trick that says make unsigned. Give, given an integer type, give me the unsigned integer type. And if you're already an unsigned integer type, this is the same as t. But if you're a signed type, if you say int, it will say unsigned int. Yes? Isn't there a performance cost to use this reference in entries? I'm sorry, are there what? Isn't there a performance cost to use this reference in entries? A performance. performance cost? No, there's not. Because you know, if you look at the underlying hardware, um, the hardware is just you're doing an add, and it's just doing a, um, a binary add with carry. Um, there is not a platform cost. It's just a single instruction to decrement a zero to get all Fs. Um, it's just a deck instruction. There's not a not an additional cost there. Yes? Does this rely on signed integers being uh, two complement? This does not. The question is, does this rely on in, signed integers being two's complement? It, it relies on the ability to cast signed integers to unsigned integers, and that unsigned integers have um, semantics that model two's complement. So in effect, yes. Um, technically, no. But um, if, if your integers are not two's complement, if your signed integers are not two's complement, then there would be a performance cost to converting them to unsigned and back, and which goes back to his question. Other questions? OK, so Davis's original paper said, here, here is an, an implementation of um, this. It says, using u, u is our unsigned type, return a plus b minus a over 2. Um, just imagine this code is wrapped in template type lane integer and enable if is integral t integer and so on and so forth. I mean, it's there, but that's not what we're here to see about. Um, oops. <laughs> um, yeah, surprisingly subtle indeed. This is not particularly subtle. He, he, he just forgot the case where B is bigger than A. But this was his this was his paper where he talked about how subtle this was and how and how careful you had to be. Oops. Um, I'm assuming in all these examples, by the way, that we have 32-bit ints and 16-bit shorts and 8-bit cares. Um, you'll see a bunch of numbers like this, and they're all 32 bits. I know we have 64-bit machines these days, but then these numbers get much longer and it's um, it doesn't fit as well on the slide, and it doesn't change the meaning. Okay, so fine. So he said, oops, I missed that. And the next revision of his paper, put up this using you make unsigned t again. And now I say, if a is bigger than, greater than b, subtract um, a from b. Otherwise, subtract b from a, and then do the division. And now we get the right answer for those. If we have shorts, oh, oh. Mm. So the problem here is, again, something we got from C, integer promotion. When you start doing math with shorts, they, 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 you get converted to an int or unsigned shorts or so on. Your, your expressions get type int and the, 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 um, 
That's a good way to put it. And then you then when you try to convert them back, you get unexpected bit patterns. This is kind of sad. Um, the code gen for this is pretty good, actually. Here's a um, a uh, bit from Godbolt. This is not a terrible code gen, except for that branch in the middle, which just absolutely destroys you. Um, the branch predictor could get it right if you know you were somebody who always passed the smaller number first, and the branch predictor said, "Yeah, I'm going to go this way," but there's not any information in this routine to tell you which way that branch is going to go. I mean, you have to actually test to see if A is bigger than B. Anyway, so, but, but it doesn't work anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so Howard Hinnon came up with this version. And if, for those of you who were in Kate's talk last uh, hour, she was ranting about single letter variable names. And well, here they are. We have little m and big M, which are the larger value or the smaller value. What do we do? We set, set A to be little and B and then swap and basically switch them if they are. And then A plus sign of doing the subtraction and division. Okay, so this code is much more complicated. But conceptually, it's not. I mean, if you go back and look at this, it's really, other than that multiplication and the sign variable, it's really the same code just spread out over many lines because this is all glommed together and that's all glommed together. So this is, yeah, lots more white space, really not more code. Okay, so how does this work? This works fine until we get to cares. <laughs> so how many people knew that C and C++, C++ had a signed care type? Many, many. How many people know about the difference between care, signed care, and unsigned care. How many people can tell me is care signed or not? On one platform. <laughs> the, the, the correct answer is yes, it is. It depends on the platform. It depends on your compiler switches sometimes. You, um, compi some compilers, Microsoft compiler, for example, and I think GCC, have a compile time switch where you could say make care unsigned or make care signed. It's like slash J something, I don't remember, but you can do that. Um, in C++ 17, just as an aside, we introduced the type std byte, um, which, you can, you, which you should be using for things you want to alias. The reason we have, the reason that we have so much trouble with care is care is special. Again, with something we got from C, a, a care star or, a, or an unsigned care star or a sign care star can alias anything else and hit special rules. For C17, we added a std byte, which is not a numeric type. It's just a collection of bits. But it gets the same aliasing rules as, um, as care star and, cons and unsigned care star. So if you're if you're you want a pointer to like a sequence of bits, you know, a sequence of bytes in memory, you should seriously consider using byte star instead of care star. Anyway, so, oops. But let's take a look at this, even though it's still wrong, let's take a look at this uh, code gen. This code gen is about the same length as the last code gen, which is not surprising because it's doing basically the same thing. But if you look at this really closely, you'll notice that there's a lack of something here. What's the, what is missing? There are no branches. There are no branches here. And so you don't have to worry about the branch predictor getting anything wrong. It just runs. There's a multiplication in here that wasn't in the other one, but it's multiplying by a constant one or minus one, and it's an integer multiplication, which is three cycles, which is a lot cheaper than a missed branch. Um, and 
this would be pretty good code gen. It's not, you know, add shift, you know, load, load, add shift store, which is A plus B over two, but it's, it's not that much worse, but it's not correct. But it, and it's certainly better than the last one we saw where, where it had that branch in the middle that you couldn't do anything with. Anyway, fine. So we had a bug fix. Bug fix is down here, when you compute this difference, you cast it to unsigned and then to the integral type. Now, some people asked me when I gave this a, a practice run of this, um, why I'm using C style casts here instead of static cast. And there's a couple of reasons. Um, the easy cop-out answer is because this is slideware and I want it to fit on the slide. And if, if I had static cast integer, static cast u, static, it's not going to fit on the slide and it obscures the, um, the meaning. But the other thing is, is that a C style cast is perfectly appropriate here because I know I'm dealing with a fundamental type. This is not, I'm not trying to cast between user defined, two user defined types or anything like that. So I'm casting between short and it. And the compiler, this is, um, this is one of these cases where I think a C style cast is preferred. Yes. So this is the style of cast in the actual implementation. There is, yes. The question is, is there a C style cast in the actual implementation? Yes. Because again, I believe, I mean, it, it doesn't change the code gen at all. And I believe that if I were to write it as static cast, it makes the code harder to understand. And you know, standard library code is ugly enough as it is. You know, it has an impenetrable wall of underscores all around it. But um, we don't, I don't need to make it more impenetrable. I'm not trying to project, protect my job here. <laughs> so this is hor This is completely impenetrable. It's only I'm the only person who can understand it. Um, interestingly enough. Uh, when we, when I did this and started running tests, um, discovered a code gen bug in LLVM. It did not actually, um, it generated, it didn't generate this code when I was dealing with short types, like shorts and cares and so on. It generated code with a branch in it. And I hopped on IRC and I talked to a couple people I knew who worked on the LLVM backend and uh, one of them who, um, I showed him the, the code gen and he looked at it and he looked at it and the next day I got an email that he had opened a bug against LLVM and had produced like four pages of documentation with intermediate code representations and, and sample output and benchmarking things showing that yes, this really was a performance bottleneck if you did this in a loop and so on. And then a couple of days later it got fixed. But in any case, so now we have Bid point four, and it gets the right answers, and it gets great code gen, and um, everything is good. We're all happy here. It doesn't have any branch, still doesn't have any branches. It's great. Um, but you might, if you're watching, we're watching really close. You might have said, "Wait, that was the same code as I saw before." Midpoint three and midpoint four generated the exact same code. That would be right, because here's midpoint three, and here's midpoint four, and they're the same code. The, the answer to that is, they are the same code when you're dealing with ints. But when you're dealing with other types, signed care, midpoint three has this, uh, Where'd it go? It has a jump in the middle of it. I need to find it. Line eight. Thank you, line eight. Compare, set length equal. Okay, and midpoint four does not. Line seven. That's a compare, not a jump. Oh. Something just rang, not my phone. Anyway, um, but it generates the correct code. We got correct answers out of the, the uh, before the, the code gen bug was fixed, but it had a jump in the middle of it, and that was unfortunate. 
And so now we have some pretty nice code. It's fairly easy to understand. You make unsigned values. If, if A is bigger than B, you swap them. And then you do basically larger minus smaller divided by two. Yes? The question is, say, in the Hilbert series, is the quantization in the test code being consistent with the uh, high size representation of the of the lower part of it? Um, so the, the question is, is on, on a 64-bit a, a machine, would you, would you be better off using the, the large registers and then just using for short types and using the um, lower half of the registers as the results? That's an interesting idea that I had not considered. So now I have something to play with when I get home. I don't know. Yes? Why do you need to pass the difference between U and U? M minus M, isn't it already U type? It, okay, the question is, why do we need to cast this to U? Isn't it, um, doesn't it uh, already a U type? No, it isn't. If, say, U would be unsigned care, the difference M minus N is of type unsigned int. That was the integer promotion that got us they are, I don't know. those answers. Okay, but anyway, wasn't this code the same? Yes, it was the same, but not for cares. Okay, any questions about the character types? Um, I am going faster than I thought, which is good. We'll have more time for questions. Okay, pointers. Pointers, it's like, okay, you have pointers, you have the distance between two pointers, you want the value in the middle, you have, say, an array of them, and you want the, the object in the middle. So you might think that if you had a um, the integer version, that you could write it like this. You say, tell me how big b minus a is, and then you calculate the midpoint of that and zero using pointer diff t, because pointer diff t is the predefined type which is capable of holding the distance between two pointers. The b minus a gives you the distance in between them in t's already. And then you add that back to a. And this is oh so close to being exactly what you want. This is really, really close. But I mean, I coded this up and I wrote a bunch of tests and I ran the tests and they all passed and I said, oh, good. And I put this into libc++ and I added the tests to libc++ and I ran them and one of my other tests failed. I said, what is the type of V here? So um, here's the funny thing. Zero, literal zero, is also a null pointer. The, the integral midpoint template has a constraint. It has a constraint. T is an integral thing. This one has no constraints and makes it a better match. It only shows up if you have zero, zero. Literal, constants, not variables that hold zero, just the literal zero. Dang. <laughs> I looked at that and looked at that and looked at because my test went on, you know, my test did this and then checked to, you know, basically said, assert is same int decal type midpoint int zero zero. And that test failed. Um, this is a, it's a pitch. When you're writing tests, test everything you can because occasionally you'll get bit by something weird and, you know, if your test goes off, you'll like, why is that test going off? It means you don't understand something, okay? This is ridiculously obscure. 
that literal zero is also a null pointer constant. Um, fortunately, this is an easy thing to fix. You put an enable if on here, you change this to be a T rather than a T star, and you say this has to be a pointer. Then they're both constrained and the zero is a, the int is a better match, or if you actually have the template parameter, it's int, it's not int star. Um, it turns out that you actually need some other constraints on this. You don't want to, for example, accept void pointers because you can't calculate the distance between two void pointers. That's, you know, you would just get a compile error. Um, for the same reason, you don't want to accept pointers to incomplete types. And you want to make sure that there are actual pointers to objects. You don't want pointers to functions. You don't want pointers to member variables, pointers to member, excuse me, member functions. You don't want any of those. So the enable if is a little bit more complicated than this, but not much more. Um, and I'm sure that most of you could just write that because there are type traits for all of this. Enable if is pointer and is not this, is not this, is not this. So I didn't really want to show that. But in any case, this actually passes all the tests. It does all the right things. Um, there's a whole bunch of undefined behavior in here if you pass it pointers to different arrays, different data structures. But that's inherent in dealing with arithmetic on pointers. You can't actually subtract two pointers that point into data different data structures. That's undefined behavior, not to mention the fact that it doesn't give you sensible answers. Because you know, one, one compile, this array could be at a lower address than this one, and you could get a, a positive number. And then the next time, next time you run it with a different optimization level, say, the compiler could lay out those arrays differently, and suddenly you get a completely different signed thing. And so in general, if you have a pointer into one data structure and a pointer into another data structure, you can't, there, can't reliably get from one to the other by incrementing it, which is what calculating the distance between them. Why? doing the subtraction actually does. It says, this is the number of times you have to increment this pointer to get to this other pointer. Yes? Why does the literal zero test fail before you write the enable if? Isn't it zero is all the way? B minus A is zero. The problem is, is that, that the midpoint returned in a different type. Oh. It returned an int star with the value zero. An int pointer with the value zero as opposed to an int with the value zero. That was the problem. The problem was is my my test that did not the test that checked the value, but the text, test that checked the return type failed. Sorry, I should have repeated the question. The question was why did my why did my test fail? Shouldn't this have returned zero because it's zero all the way? And the answer is yes, it did return zero, but it returned the wrong type. It returned a pointer. It returned a null pointer basically, as an int pointer with the value zero. And what would like I'm sorry if I broke. What would happen if you uh, wrote int b equals omega a instead of alpha b? Oh, if I had, what would happen if I wrote int v? The compiler would probably go off and say, I can't, I can't assign an int pointer to an int. Yes. Um, so if I had not, if I had said int, I would have got a compile error. But I also had an assertion that based a static assertion that said. Does this return the type I'm expecting? And that test failed. Does that mean that uh, it better use specific types in your test cases rather than using alpha? Would that save you a little time though? Um, would that have saved me a little time if I had used specific types instead of auto? The problem is my um, my tests were are pretty heavily templated because I'm testing ints and longs and yeah. Um, I have a template, a templated function that tests a whole bunch of things for a particular type, and then I do run that over a dozen different types. Um, if I had said whatever T or whatever this was here, I would have gotten a compile error. But I, I was going to write a static assert to make sure that the to make sure not that the type was convertible, because if I write T here and midpoint returns something bad that happened to be convertible to int, it would work. But instead, I, I actually had an assertion that said, no, it has to be exactly this. It has to be, this has to be exactly int, not something convertible to it. And so, yes, I would have gotten an, I would have gotten an error message at the same time, and it probably would have been a, it would have been another clue that something's wrong. Uh, but I don't think it would have added 
anything. If I didn't have the static assert, it would have been a really helpful thing to see. Split static assert. Static asserts don't generate any code at runtime. And you know, it's amazing how often the static asserts in our test suite have gone off and just said, um, this is not what I expect. This is not the type that I expect. Yes, back there. Uh, can you make it work on incomplete types by just casting the in pointer type first? So can you make it work on in pointers to incomplete types by path casting it to uint pointer t or whatever, however you spell that? The type that is um, the integer type that is guaranteed to be big enough to hold the difference of any pointers. So you could make it work for that, but I don't know what the answer would mean. Presumably the user would eventually. The, 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 the thing is, I because because I don't know how big incomplete types are. I can't give you an answer. If you tell me, I you give me two pointers. Okay. I can return a pointer in the middle, you know, but if the objects are bigger than one byte, I might return an invalid pointer, a pointer into the middle of one of those objects. And yeah, that's that's not going to help anybody. Um, if you know, if if your objects, your incomplete objects are are a size of two, a power of two in size, well, I, well it will all work. But if they're not, you could, it's quite likely to get a, a pointer in the middle of an object. But, so I don't know how big the objects are, so I can't tell you how many objects there are between A and B, so I can't hit one of those points. Anybody else? Yes. If I left out the, um, the template parameter here, um, that depends. It's, I, it's not ambiguous because um, one will require. Um, I'm trying to remember why it's not ambiguous because I looked into this. Um, one one of them is um, one of them is a constrained template which will do no conversions, and the other one is an unconstrained template that takes a pointer. But the interesting thing is zero is. I was not quite accurate before. Zero is a z literal zero is something that can be converted to a pointer, and so there's a conversion there. And so what I, my what I found was you had to actually specify this to get this behavior. You couldn't if you called it on without the explicit template parameter, it went to the scalar version, which is what you want. So this is a real corner case. Yes, in the front. Could you elaborate? Mm -hmm. So the question was, can I talk about the um, the pointer implementation? Um, let's look at that one. They're pretty much the same. Um, is, is the integer implementation was biased towards A or B, whichever came first? If there's an odd, if the if the number of if the the number of steps was odd, this is exactly the same way because I'm deferring to the integer implementation. I'm calling the integer implementation. I'm basically taking midpoint of zero and the distance between them. Right. So if you pass B, which is a bigger point, bigger pointer, where if B minus A is in fact a negative number, then yes, it will be biased towards B instead of towards A. Yes. There's a, a minor issue. Um, back out. The, the problem is, is that that's, that's the purpose. The, the comment was that there could be um, that subtracting two pointers um, could overflow a pointer diff t, but that's the point of pointer diff t, is that it's supposed to be big enough to handle the distance between any two pointers. Yeah. And so... Um, Except it is that if it isn't, but I can't really do anything about that. I mean, that's the purpose of pointer diff t there. It's undefined behavior, and and you can't. Um, a lot of. Yeah, I I don't know how to get around that. 
because I mean, you have to do the pointer subtraction to figure out how big those things are. And you can't really, you could do some of the mechanics yourself, but you're still going to have, you know, you're, you're going to have to find an appropriately sized um, integer type. And pointer diff t is usually one of the bigger ones. Yeah, but size t doesn't give you the the a greater than b, b, b less than a thing. I will take a look at that and think about that. Are we not expecting that two pointers are in the same array? Because otherwise yes, we are absolutely expecting that two pointers are in the same array. So if they're not in the same array, you've got undefined behavior just, just doing the subtraction without worrying about whether it overflows. And so a single array, that's, that's a tough. It would be a weird case. It would be a weird case. Other questions? All right. I'm going to go a little more quickly through the floating point stuff. I only have a couple slides on that. But any other questions about pointers, integers? Michael? So are you going to floating point afterwards? Yes. Is there a handling of iterator midpoint? There is not. There's just pointers. Then the, and um, you could you could write one of these for random access iterators, but not any other kind of iterators. I mean, not efficiently. You could, you know, if you, for a forward iterator, right? You could start at the beginning and count how many there are, and then go back to the beginning and go halfway. But no, there isn't any for iterators here. There was nothing proposed for iterators. I suspect that the reason for that was because the proposal came from uh, Sandia Labs, where they like to, you know, they like to model blowing things up because it's ever so much cheaper than actually blowing things up. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Don't blame us. Okay. Um, I thought, I, I'm sorry, I thought Davis was, was in Sandia. Okay. Ezra and then Michael. Is there intent behind uh, the argument pointer of T, putting the type thing as an, an argument instead of just asking for the uh, argument? Um, is, there, is there a reason to do pointer diff T as an argument rather than a template parameter? Um, not particularly, no. I believe you get the same results either way. Um, you do want to say pointer diff t here to make it very clear that that that's the uh, the call you want to make. But it could you know that this the result of subtracting two pointers is always pointer diff t. Yes, you had another question, Michael. I don't know. Yes, I don't know. OK, anyway, floating point. So one of the requirements on floating point, if we go all the way back to the specifications, was that is at most one inexact operation. OK, and inexact operations can be mostly division, the division. So let's see. This is, there's a ton of special cases here. And I'm going to kind of look, touch on a few of them and, and ignore other ones. I have tests for all of them, and I don't need to do handle many of them specially, so I'm good with that. Um, but we have to deal with de denormalized values. Maybe everybody here familiar with denormalized floating point values? A few. Um, you can, floating point numbers, usually you have a mantissa and an exponent and a sign. And the way that they're usually stored, at least in IEEE 754, is that they get an extra bit of mantissa by not store it, by shifting everything over until the first bit of the mantissa is one and, and adjusting the exponent. And then they don't store that one, it's just assumed. So instead of 51 bits of mantissa, which is how much you store in the float, you store, there's 52 bits of mantissa and the first one is one. But for very, very small numbers, you might have zeros all through the mantissa and you know, the last few digits because 
the, the exponent is already as small as it can go. And so you have zero, zero, you know, your exponent is, is two to the minus what? A thousand. And then your mantissa is zero, 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 one, oh, one, oh, one, oh. And those are called denormalized values. Um, infinities, not a numbers. Hopefully people are a little more familiar with that. Um, and the standard says you can only get one inexact operation. So, and the other thing, of course, is like anything having to do with floating point, testing this is a bear. Because why? You can't actually test floating point numbers for equality, not reliably. You do arithmetic, and then you have to say, is this like, like what I expected? Is this close enough? Is this, um, it's, you know, maybe it differs in the bottom bit from what I'm expecting. And when you're trying to write portable tests, tests that run on different architectures, yeah, testing for equality is just a way to make yourself nuts. By the way, um, you can if you if you really want to compare for equality, um, I love hex floats. You you can you convert things um, to you output something as a hex float, which is a hex bit pattern, and then compare that. You get and then, and you can print those out, and that's way easier to see the difference between you've got six or eight hex digits versus 20 decimal digits. And sometimes the decimal digits, they're all the same. You know, you, you, you say, it says this value is different from this value and you print them out to 16 or 17 decimal places and they're the same. But with hex floats, it prints out the bit patterns and you look and oh, look, yeah, the last two bits are different. So if you have to debug this stuff, just learn to read hex floats. It will help you a lot. Anyway, so here we go. Um, what do we do here? We grab the numeric limits of the type we're dealing with. Now, if you're, how many people are familiar with numeric limits? How many people use numeric limits for integer stuff? How many people use numeric limits for floating point stuff? A few. Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> anyway, um, min and max mean different things for floating point numbers than they do for integers. Max is the largest finite value that can be represented. Min is not the smallest finite value that can be represented, but is the smallest positive number that can be represented normally. So anything smaller than that and still positive is a denormalized number. Anyway, so we, we grab a couple things and then we say, we check to see the typical case is that it's not infinity and it's not um, denormalized and we do a plus b over two because hey that's the answer we want and we're dealing with floating points and it gives you the right answer um, if one of them is denormalized we do the division on the other if the other is denormalized we do the division and, and otherwise we divide them both and then add this gives us better value um, you see max over two here this max over two so if if the numbers are bigger than half of the, 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 the largest finite value, we do we have them and then add rather than um, adding, which will give us an infinity, and then half, which will stay at infinity. So this is not, this is code that I'm not really happy with, but it gives the right answers and it is, um, and it doesn't have any special magic knowledge in there of things like, oh yeah, I have 52 bits of, uh, of mantissa in this. It doesn't have, I don't have to special case float double, long double. It works for all of them because it works with numeric limits. Um, it works with different floating point formats. Um, although I had my tests fail for IBM PowerPC long doubles, the 128 bit long doubles. Uh, some people who have worked with them are giggling. Um, and uh, this was because I, I wrote a, a very simple test. I picked a value. It doesn't really matter what value. It was a finite value. I called next after on it to get the next representable value. And then I said, so I called those A and B. And then I did midpoint of A and B and midpoint of B and A. And I said, okay, there's nothing in between them. So midpoint A and B has to be a, it can't be anything else, and midpoint of B and A has to be 
B can't be anything else, and it wasn't. Yes. Excuse me. Say that again. I didn't hear you. Yes, you are correct. Typo. Thank you. That should be a B. Now I have to go check my sources and make sure that I, I <laughs> messed it up on the slide instead of in my code. Thank you. And if, it, if it's messed up in my code, it means my tests aren't good enough. Um, anyway, to finish this, it turned out there was a bug in next after on Ubuntu in using I, on, on the PowerPC using 128 bit long bubbles that next after gave me number, gave me a floating point value where there were values in between. It's not supposed to do that. Yes. Um, so the, the likely and unlikely um, branches, branch notations are very, very new. They're in, um, they're new in C++ 20, and we have not rolled them out in libc++. Um, if we were to do that, the question was about the, uh, helping out the branch predictor with, with likely and unlikely. If we were to do that, um, I would probably label this, this case right here, as the most likely because that's the same case. It's, we're not infinity, we're not denormalized numbers. Both of the, you know, the numbers, the, both of these numbers are less than half of infinity. Okay, so adding them will not give you infinity. Yes? Some algorithm, so the, the comment was there's a lot of risk to doing that because there's a lot of algorithms that generate intermediate NANDs. Um, I'm not sure when you say, when you say there's a lot of risk to doing that, I Sorry, don't know. That, meaning labeling your branches. Oh, labeling your branches. There's, there's a risk of labeling your branches because a lot of algorithms generate intermediate NANDs. Okay, yes. Do you really need, for, in, uh, for, the, for the small a and for the small b, do you really need to add a over top or B to the A over top? Because as I understood those 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 like okay. Basically B is infinity, right? I mean big one. B is a big one. And A is a small one. So they are like in the different holes mm -hmm. and you can skip the at, at all. Mm. And make it less confusing actually. Um less. no, because all you know here is that um in this one that is that B is um Whereas your, your first condition says that at yeah. least one is above high. Um, high and over, then yeah. Second condition says that A is below low, so B is above high. So you had kind of. And so your point is, is that you, we may not need to do yes. some of these operations. Yeah. I, I will go play with them. Thank you. That's a that's an optimization opportunity I had. Increase readability. Mm -hmm. Other questions. Any questions? Yes. Why are we not using a similar algorithm for integers? Because, oh, because this is actually a lot of work. Um, this is far more work than the integer algorithm. The integer algorithm, you know, comes down to like ten or twelve instructions, um, and we don't have infinities in uh, the integers. Instead, we have overflow, which is undefined behavior. Um, we could, in fact, check to make sure that, for example, for the integer case, that A and B are both less than, you know, the absolute value of A and B is less than half of the max value, so that when you add them, it don't it overflow. But that's a lot of tests and a lot of branches, and the code we have for the integer stuff is is actually pretty efficient. So it's it's more of an efficiency concern than than anything. Um, we worked pretty hard in the uh, the integer cases to get rid of all the branches. There's there's one test if a is if a is greater than b and no branches. Um, anyway, um, whoops. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, this is more the specification of the interface. Just it's disturbing that passing the argument the other way around is a different result. Is there a reason to do that? <laughs> Um, we had to decide on something, um, but I believe what the, the difference was, sorry, the, the, the question was, 
was why why does the specification say that um, when you pass the arguments in a different order, you get a different answer? And uh, partially, it's you know when you think about it, it's you're going midway from A to B or midway from B to A. But um, I suspect that this is comes from the people who were interested at the beginning. If you're doing simulations and you're stepping stepping around a, 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 a space where you're you're measuring things as you step you don't want you know, you start at at a thousand and you step and you step halfway over and over again you want those steps to be consistent it doesn't matter which direction you're coming from you're coming from plus a thousand towards zero or minus a thousand up to up to zero you want those steps to be the same size whether you're calling counting down or counting up I guess it's also because it kind of just called the function that min a b as the first argument and max a b as the second one that would give you the symmetric behavior. Um, I'm not sure I understand the point. You're making. Sorry, you, so you, your you comment want, was you want like a symmetric version right. of the function. You could just instead of calling it as midpoint a b, you could call it as midpoint min a b comma max a b. You you could certainly do that, or. Or, or you could wrap it and and do the test outside yourself. Yeah, you could you could call it as if you had an A and a B, you could call min of AB and max of AB and pass those as the first and second parameters respectively. But um, that's going to add a fair amount of overhead, okay? Because min and max are each going to have a, a test in a branch. So, all right, um, my little clock here says that we have run out of time. So why why don't we Short okay. Has any uh, of the existing standard libraries already implemented solution testing? Yes. The question is, have any um, any standard libraries implemented said midpoint? Yes. I know this for a fact because libc++ has. I implemented it. <laughs> um, at one point, it was very interesting. At one point, I had eight different implementations of midpoint, of which I believe three were correct. <laughs> I mean, of the integer version of. Anyway.